foremost, welcome to all of you for the first of our Road to Recovery webinars. They're fe featuring the species working groups from across the country. I'm Paul Schmidt. I'm the executive director for Road to Recovery, and I have some of uh, the Road to Recovery staff as well on, on the call. Um, we have, uh, we've just begun this monthly webinar uh, series planned for the second Friday of each month at one o'clock in the Eastern time. And we're beginning today with the, the work of the least turn. Our goal is to provide a forum for discussion and learning around the goal of recovering species. We will begin shortly with a presentation followed by a question and answer period. We want the question and answer period to be very interactive and beneficial for both the presenter, Tom in this case, and the participants. So be thinking of your comments and your questions. This idea was spawned from the successful panel discussion that we had at the American Ornithological Society's meeting in August. We hope that these webinars will help the attendees and the spotlighted species working group gain ideas and insights into their efforts to recover species, particularly those that we call the tipping point species. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the road to recovery, but let me remind you of, um, that R2R is a response to the three billion birds lost paper and has a goal to inspire and enhance the use of targeted and actionable science to recover declining bird populations before they become extinct. There is an urgency to this work to develop science and apply conservation actions treatments to reverse those trends that have been well documented. R2R is doing this work in several ways, including these webinars, virtual engagement sessions that we've had over the past year or so, consultative services and workshops. Speaking of those, uh, these forums, we have our next virtual engagement session planned for Friday, November 3rd, which will be focused on the integration of social science into this work. On Thursday, November the 16th, we'll have our second hemispheric engagement session titled, Halting and Reversing the Loss of Migratory Birds Through Strengthened Linkages Across Flyways. And then, very exciting, we're gonna have our first in-person workshop that is planned for January 17th through 19th um, at the National Conservation and Training Center. And I encourage all of you to register as soon as possible for that workshop. Take a look at it on our website, uh, r2rbirds.org. We've actually now listed, uh, not only have a flyer available and registration form, but we also have the actual agenda, draft agenda up for you to take a look at, but I hope you'll join us then. Okay, now for today's webinar. This is our first effort with this forum, and we have a unique species to highlight today. The least tern has been listed endangered for decades, and there's a new effort afoot to establish a species working group to use the R2R process to recover this species and remove it from the ESA list. In the coming webinars, we'll feature all four of our pilot species and other working groups will share their work and experience. I hope you'll attend all of them. A note, um, I did say the, the, um, the webinars are gonna be the second Friday of every month. It just so happens that next month that falls on a federal holiday here in the United States. So we're gonna move that to uh, Friday, November the 17th because of that uh, conflict with Veterans Day. Okay, now let's turn to this over to our international fellow, Esmeralda Bravo, to introduce today's webinar and speaker. And remember, keep your microphone on mute uh, until it's time. And um, I am recording this. And by the way, Tom is bilingual. So if you wanna ask your questions or make your comments in Spanish, uh, that will be fine. So with that, I'll turn it over to Esmeralda. Hi, and welcome again, everyone, to the first uh, r 2 webinar. I'm happy to see all of you in the, in the audience today. Um, it is my pleasure to, to introduce Tom Ryan. He's a wildlife biologist, avian ecologist, and an educator that deep passion for conservation. 
Uh, he teaches biology, zoology, and marine biology and at Pasadena City College and Rio Hondo College. He has worked with the recovery teams for the California Easter, Western Snowy Plovers, Peruvian Terror, and the Binational Research Team for the Eastern in the US and Mexico. So he has experience working with state and federal agencies, as well as private sector in California. Currently, he's pursuing a PhD at CCC, a research institute in Mexico. Uh, his dissertation topic is the study and interconnectivity of Eastern populations in California and Northwestern Mexico. And we are excited to hear from here. So as, as you already hear, he's bilingual, so feel free to share any comments or questions uh, in English or Spanish. And we will also keep an eye on the chat looking for your questions or comments. So Tom, over to you. Thank you very much, Esmeralda. I'm just going to put up the talk right off the bat here and we'll get going. All right. So just a quick check. Uh, the, the, the title slide is up, correct? Okay, great. Well, thank you guys, uh, everybody for coming and spending part of your, your morning or early afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, let me just start off a little bit with uh, the bird that I'm going to be talking about today. The uh, least tern is a small seabird. It's the smallest of the terns. Um, they uh, have a habit of nesting on uh, beaches, estuaries. Uh, the substrate typically is, is sand, small gravel. Uh, they can also use salt flats. And as you can see in this title slide, um, they lay their eggs directly onto the sand. The eggs are extremely cryptic, um, and that's pretty much their, their best defense against predators. So they nest semi-colonially, um, depending on the, the setting, anywhere from as probably as close as a meter from each other all the way in more of a spread out situation, 25, 30 meters uh, between nests. Um, the birds that I'm going to be talking about today um, are this, this group um, that's composed of um, uh, two of the uh, described subspecies. Now, the, the current status of the subspecies of least terns is a bit up in the air, um, but uh, the California least tern, um, Sternula antiarum browni, uh, it occurs pretty much from San Francisco Bay south through the Baja Pen uh, California Peninsula. Now, just where that ends is is subject to, to quite a bit of interest and debate. Um, there are citations that have it going all the way to the tip of uh, Baja, but um, uh, for a long time we've we've thought that that you know, there's there's very limited connectivity um, among those po those populations. The other subspecies in this region that I'm going to be working in is Mexicanus, and this was described um, in the in the 30s. Um, the description, the original description was oh, kind of iffy at best, and those who have re reviewed it, um, the comments usually are is that it needs to be further reviewed with, with additional data. Now, the bird itself, they do occur throughout North America. Uh, there is a population that occurs in the river systems in the central part of North America, and then the dominant race um, occurs through the Atlantic, Gulf Coast, and winters in the Caribbean and uh, in uh, Northern South America. So the status of this bird, um, so for, for starters within Mex Mexico, they are granted what's called special protection. Um, it's a fairly limited protected status. Um, they're not considered endangered in Mexico. Within the United States, the California lease term um, is federally endangered and was listed in, in each of the uh, kind of the, the precursors and the current endangered species act. It is considered endangered by the state of California who takes the lead on uh, least turn monitoring and recovery efforts within the state. Um, we don't have any critical habitat and the recovery plan is an interesting one. It was one of the very first ones that was ever done uh, back before they really had a model for what a cover, recovery plan should look like. Look like now, Fish and Wildlife Service has um, been reviewing the species fairly regular, regularly. The most recent one was in 2020. 
Now, with the original recovery plan, um, the, the problem is, is that it really wasn't based on any sort of modeling. Um, one of my, my, my former grad advisors, Charlie Collins, who was there for the meetings, and Charlie's description of how they came up with the 1,200 breeding pairs was they took what they currently had and doubled it. So that was the, the, about the level of, of, uh, of investigation that went into coming up with that number. And it's a similar thing with the number of nest sites and then also the, the goal of one young per pair over uh, three years. So none of these are really based on any, any uh, substantial modeling that, uh, for the species. So before 2008, um, we kind of have the tale of two recoveries. Um, prior to 2008, after it was declared endangered, uh, there was a considerable effort, especially to protect and fence in the nesting areas that existed. Now, keep in mind, Southern California is growing in population during this time. Um, you have increasing urbanization along the coast. And one of the, the big priorities was just to put a physical barrier around these kind of primary nesting areas, uh, particularly in these urban areas. So the, the first couple of, of, of uh, you know, first two decades, a lot of the effort was put around protecting the nest sites, restricting access. Um, there has been a, a whole network of colony monitors. We have over a hundred people working annually to monitor the loose term. Uh, beginning in the mid eighties, there was extremely aggressive predator control that was added. Um, and that really, the, the population really responded to all of these things. Um, now that leads us to kind of 2008, um, this period between 2007 and 2009, when things kind of turn around, okay? And so here's the graph from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and it just kind of shows this increase where we had um, the initial protections and then the fencing of the colonies through the kind of mid to late 80s. And then you can really see this inflection point where the colonies start to really grow um, up to about 5,000 breeding pairs in the mid 2000s. Now, there is some debate, um, this jump from 5,000 up to 7,000 as to whether or not this is um, a real population jump or a problem with our counting methods, which I'll get to in a second. But one thing nobody debates is that after um, about 2008, we've seen a steady decline in the number of breeding pairs of these terms. Um, when we did the, the uh, mark recapture study using the, the uh, alphanumeric uh, mark birds that I'll talk about in a second, um, for the period between 2016 and 2019, we estimated there were about 1,830 individuals. Uh, the colony monitors during that same period reported um, about 3,800. Um, part of the problem we think is that we know that the least turns nest multiple times at the same site if they fail and will move to a secondary site and attempt at least one more additional time. And so we think that you know, they may have started to see some resistance and some increased predation um, around the early 2000s. And that jump might just be um, you know, a, a reflection of uh, the colonies abandoning and relocating at other locations. Now, again, around 2008, we definitely see a decline. Um, a lot of what we think is the reason behind that decline is a, uh, a kind of a, a crash and then um, a lot of variability in the central stock of northern anchovies. And this is the group that occurs um, off of central uh, California from uh, actually from northern California down through to the Baja California Peninsula. Uh, so this this stock was you know fairly stable. Um, spiked in 2005, 2006, and then declined rapidly between 2009 and 2015. Now, since this time, um, it has kind of gone up and down and has been really variable. But the turn population, again, kind of crashed right around the same time. And we've seen indications in their behavior that um, they are food stressed in, in several of the years. So since that time, um, you know, we've got this decline in anchovies, which is there has been linked to nest success in California. 
This is also, um, we've also been observing declined adult attendance at many of these colonies. So the problem here, we think, is that the birds are having to leave and spend more time off colony. So in a healthy turn colony, you have a bird, at least one bird per nest sitting on the nest incubating, along with a fairly good number of loafing birds that can help defend the colony. But when the birds are off uh, foraging at farther distances, um, often you'll have no adults at all at the nest. Both pairs will be off the colony, and it really opens the colony up to predation, uh, particularly by corvids. Um, the other thing, in fencing in the colonies, we've really restricted these nesting areas. Um, when you add the fencing and the predator control, uh, probably a lot of these nesting areas have much higher density than you would normally see. Um, you know, concentrating that many birds in one spot is going to attract more predators. Um, along with all of this, in general, we all have experienced this kind of decreased environmental funding, both at the federal and the state level. Also, um, increased permit restrictions, uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, um, we've had problems getting uh, particularly depredation permits for raptors. Um, and then we've also have the, the unique situation where we have endangered predators eating endangered birds, which with the gull bill turn and, and before that the peregrine falcon uh, really makes for, for some, some really difficult decisions to be made. Um, and then also within particularly Southern California, you've got increased development and population around these urban um, centers. And this has really expanded along the coast. Um, Along with that, and you can see this reflected in a number of different metrics, uh, Christmas counts, eBird, um, we definitely have increased corvid populations along the coast. And in fact, corvids, during our plover counts, we see them frequently foraging on, on uh, isopods uh, on, in kelp patties. So corvids have become a regular beach bird here in Southern California. So looking at all of this, you know, and kind of bringing us to, to 2023, um, you know, looking at, first of all, you know, where are our knowledge gaps? So uh, a number of people are studying foraging and, and time budgets. Um, San Diego Zoo is doing a study on that right now. Um, and then regional movement and dispersal. So that's kind of the part I've taken a look at. We've seen these declines. And one of the really big questions before we get going on any population models is, are the birds simply moving elsewhere? And we've certainly seen this with other species of terns. The elegant tern moved to, into California following the you know, El Nino in the early 1980s. So you know, one of the questions is, is are these birds just simply going to those colonies um, along the west coast of Mexico? Um, the other thing is, is as uh, as you mentioned, um, we don't know where these birds winter. Um, despite 50 years of protected status, uh, we still do not know, well, we do now, um, where these birds winter. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so some of the questions that we're also looking at is what is the age structure of our population? Um, one of the things that you might have noticed in that population graph is we've also had pretty poor fledging success rates. And so one of the things that we know we have is a bit of a surge that's moving through the population, followed by a trough. And so we're predicting that the population is going to decline based on the current age structure. One of the other things that we really need to get a handle on is survival to first breeding. We don't have a good estimate of that. And then we... The, the most recent annual adult survival estimates are from the 1980s, so we needed to do that as well. Um, one of the things that we've seen in, in our alphanumeric study is it's likely that not all adults return in all years, and so we need to get an estimate of that. Um, we're still working on, you'll see, our, our population estimate is, is pretty broad, and um, so we're trying to, to narrow that down with uh, increased um, data coming in from mark recapture. Finally, we, we really need to do a some sort of population viability analysis, population modeling to better inform those recovery goals. And that's what we really want to do through this process. So a little bit about migration and wintering with the least term. Um, we know that there are nesting colonies that go all the way down the west coast of Mexico through Oaxaca, Chiapas, and then down into the countries of Central America. Um, 
So it, we have observations of wintering lease terms throughout Mexico and um, the Eastern Tropical Pacific along Central America. Problem is, is are these California lease terms or are they the local breeding birds? So when we look at this map, there's a couple of things that really stand out. And there are some really nice upwelling zones um, right off the coast of um, kind of around Puerto Vallarta, uh, Tehuantepec, Papagayo, and the, the Gulf of Panama. Um, we know also that there's large numbers of black terns that nest, or that sorry, that winter particularly off Central America, and least terns have frequently been seen with them. So we strongly suspected for a long time that this is where they went. Uh, we also have records of those one-year-olds. So we've got two um, valid records of birds marked in Southern California that have been detected in Guatemala and Honduras. Unfortunately, both were during the breeding season. Um, so we know that they moved to this area. It's just, again, you know, nobody's ever spotted an adult loose turn with one of our bands on it um, wintering in this area. So what we're doing, we're currently looking at um, primary feathers, which are grown between December and March for stable isotopes and linking them to isotopic um, isoscapes off of the Eastern Tropical Pacific and then really actually looking at the whole Pacific. And um, the current indications are, um, I'm not gonna get into somebody else's research too deeply, but um, the current indications are that this is likely a little bit overwintering. Now, this is really important because um, this is a graphic from um, 2021, which was a La Nina year. And you can see the, the currents moving across the, the isthmus at Tehuantepec, Papagayo, and Panama. Now, one of the things with El Nino is one of the first signs we, that we have in El Nino is that this, this wind pattern stops and it shuts down, um, that then shuts off these upwellings. So if our birds are going into this area, um, you know, this may be one of the reasons why in the past we have noted population declines and particularly poor cohort success during and following um, El Nino events. So again, finding out where they winter is really important. Um, now, to do all of this, what we're doing is we have a, a program in California and then also on the Baja California Peninsula and as of last year in Sonora to mark lease terms with field readable alphanumeric bands. So this is my highly technical, incredibly complex trap. Um, I am teased about it throughout the coast of Mexico when somebody sees it. Um, but it works, and uh, it's, we've, we've got about 2,000 least turns using this thing, so um, yeah, who's laughing now? Um, so what we've done, and you'll notice, of course, the, the band color selection was done by our, our Mexican colleagues, um, and so the white bands are for adults in the United States, the green ones are for juveniles in the United States, red ones are birds that are marked on the Baja California Peninsula, and the uh, we now have blue for Sonora. And we have a whole network of observers looking for these banded birds. Now, the other thing, um, we have one of our volunteers in Los Cabos, Miguel. Uh, he works for uh, surveillance at the, uh, the, the resorts there, and his thing is cameras. And so he came up with the idea of putting a GoPro next to a nest. And so we've since been using these, these GoPros. And the, um, the picture behind me is also one that's taken from a more modern GoPro. And these are really effective at getting our, our, uh, our alphanumerics, our alphanumeric bands read. Um, this has been a, Miguel did a great job with this. Um, and so we've, we've been going out, we've been doing recaptures using the cameras, also trapping adult birds, taking morphometric measurements. Uh, we're, we're looking at doing an integrated taxonomic approach to these different populations of terns. Uh, We've been collecting uh, DNA analysis. Another student at Sucesse, Liliana, is going to be uh, doing her master's on uh, the genetics of the birds. One of the things we really want to look at is connectivity um, and you know, kind of how recently there is interconnection among the populations. And then also looking at these, these stable isotopes. So we've been taking samples from uh, three feathers on each wing, alternating uh, primary feathers 
and uh, looking at, at the stable acetate ratios of carbon and nitrogen in these feathers. And one of the most important things about our program is it really is a collaboration. Um, you know, everybody asks about, is there a name? Is there an organization? And no, there isn't. It is a, a group of people who want to work together. Um, and we've been doing so very successfully on the, especially on the Baja California Peninsula since 2017. And we're working on um, establishing this in Sonora and have had great success there as well. Um, and a lot of these, these folks have been working with uh, um, other researchers on shorebirds or doing um, turtle, um, turtle preservation for a number of years and are very familiar with these beaches. And so we're using this existing infrastructure and just incorporating uh, monitoring and research on lease terms into, into their efforts. And it's, it's a, a very mutually beneficial thing because um, you know, it's, it's just one more source of information um, and partnership that can also help them to, to protect some of the other species that occur along with the least trends in these areas, such as Wilson's plovers, um, snowy plover, uh, American oyster catcher, and then also the, the sea turtles that come ashore just after the, the least turn nesting season is over. Um, so again, um, We've been trying to support these local uh, groups, writing grants to um, um, to get you know, funding for training, signage equipment, you know, all of those essential things that that just take um, you know it, it takes money to do, and um, we have no shortage of knowledge, ability, and enthusiasm. Um, so we're just you know, again trying to work with them and support them. So here's some just some pictures. This is our group, um, part of our group from uh, Baja, California. Uh, these are pictures from Estero Punta Banda, uh, Baja, California sewer. Uh, this, these are efforts that are done both up in uh, La Paz and then also throughout the uh, East Cape and Los Cabos region. Uh, Sonora, we've got groups in uh, Golfo uh, de Santa Clara, um, uh, Puerto Panasco, uh, Bahia Quino, uh, Guaymas, and then the, the group in Guaymas works on the, the lagoon south of Guaymas in Sonora. And we already have a, a, a fantastic group that's been protecting and studying snowy plovers in Ceuta, uh, Sinaloa, Medardo, and his crew. And they've been really welcoming and really helpful with, with our efforts with these streams there as well. Uh, we also have a photographer that's working with us, and uh, um, Celine is working, kind of looking at the the connection between, you know, people, the community, and then the scientists and the birds. And she's been doing this fantastic um, kind of uh, you know, a series of photographs and and, and you know, documenting the work that all of these people have been doing to help the birds. A little bit of data. I'm the scientist. This is my thing. <laughs> um, so um, we've um, we've been looking at connectivity, and again, this is all very preliminary. But these are some of our early numbers, and what we see in terms of of the um, the field readable alphanumerics and where these birds are, are moving, as well as as captured banded uh, USGS birds. Um, we, there's a lot of interchange among the colonies within the state of California. Not at, unexpected. Uh, the closer colonies are to each other, the more interchange we see. But then we also do see um, interchange between California and Baja California. So we've had birds um, uh, that have nested at Camp Pendleton, Balaquitos, Chula Vista, San Diego Bay, Tijuana, um, turn up at Estero Punta Banda and San Quintin. We've had birds from uh, San Quintin we had one um, that was born in Kansink, hatched in St. Quintin, show up at the nesting colony at Oceano Dunes. So we know that there's fairly regular exchange of, of birds between northern uh, Baja, north of St. Quintin, and the rest of California. Uh, down the, the birds that we've been marking, again, we've got about five years of data on Baja California sewer. Uh, we see mostly those birds you know, moving among their own colonies. So uh, we see movement uh, within uh, uh, birds from Los Cabos, other colonies in Los Cabos, and 
from Los Cabos to La Ribera, which is just north of Cabo Colmo on the, the East Cape. We haven't seen any exchange between La Paz and, and Los Cabos, which is kind of interesting because we do have a, a fair number of birds that have been marked in each location. So this is definitely one of our more interesting observations. We just got this back. And this is a bird that was banded at Huntington State Beach in 2022 and was observed in its first year, um, almost a year to the date later, um, in Honduras. Um, so this is the type of information you can get from these, these, uh, these field-readable alphanumerics. Um, so one of the things that we're working on in Mexico right now is, is to really do an evaluation of each of these sites as we visit them for what the, the primary issues at the sites are. Um, now, a lot of the sites, it's, it's native predators, coyotes, um, but we also, especially closer to larger uh, towns, we see more human-related predators, such as feral dogs, um, occasionally cats closer into towns, and then also ravens that may be associated with both the towns and um, roads and power lines between the towns. Uh, we certainly see a lot of impacts of off-road vehicles around these colonies. Uh, colonies, any colony near a town, almost all of them have some impact from, from off-road vehicles. Um, coastal development, uh, we saw this particularly in the, the Los Cabos uh, East Cape, and then also around um, Panasco and, and uh, Bahia Aquino. Um, and then human recreation. You know, remember, these birds are nesting during the summer on the beaches. And just like in, in California, people like, love to go to the beach on a nice summer day. Um, so we, we definitely see impacts there as well. Now, our population estimate, that's one of the things that we're working on. Um, really, the, the, the last published you know, solid population estimate for um, the, the, the region of, of the upper Gulf of, of California, Sonora, uh, was done by Eduardo Palacios in 1996. And so one of the goals is to see, you know, kind of what colonies are still active and roughly what our numbers are. And one of the things, these, these numbers really don't cite them just yet. Um, we're still working statistically to, to better refine our estimate range. But for the time being, um, just to kind of give you an idea of the range that we're looking at, we're looking at the, the lowest adult count between 2019 and 2023, so the last five years, and the highest adult count at each of these colonies. So the big problem is that not all the colonies are surveyed during the, the, um, in each of the years. So again, we're looking at, at some, some statistical methods for, for creating better estimates of error. Um, so hold with me, but this, this at least gives you a fairly good idea of what we're looking at. So within each of these areas, um, within each of these zones, the Sonora Upper Gulf, Sonora Lower Gulf, and uh, Sinaloa, um, the areas that we're covering are about 500 kilometers. And we see within the Upper Gulf, um, you know, it, it, the, the actual number is likely more um, towards the higher range, three or 400 would be my best guess. Um, Within the lower Gulf, again, it's a fairly similar range, um, about 200 to 500. Um, within it, this area, again, this is an area where we have really good counts during some years and highly variable counts at other sites and others. Uh, but you know, it gives you an idea of, again, about, you know, probably in the range of three to 400 pairs. And the uh, Sinaloa, this area is much larger. Um, Sinaloa is, is a, a big quandary in our study because we know that there probably are a lot of colonies in this area that are just simply not counted. There's, uh, we have a real lack of, of coverage in this area. Um, if you see the top one, uh, Isla Santa Maria, um, that is one that, that is very rarely covered and we know it is a very important colony. Since we see very high counts there in the years that we get counts there. So... Um, again, we're, we're still working on this. This is very definitely a work in progress, but at least it gives us some idea of what's there. All right, and overall through the range, okay, um, each of these red dots represents either an, a, an active or a recently active colony um, within the last 30 years. Um, and the, the yellow polygon, this is an area that we definitely can ascribe to 
um, the California Lee Strand. This is the area where we see interchange. Uh, you can see that the population estimate is, is very broad. Um, we are going to be running the mark recapture again later on this year um, to, to, uh, to see if we, we see a similar uh, low number compared to what the, the monitors are reporting. Um, and we, we strongly suspect we have fewer birds. It's probably closer to the lower end of that range rather than the higher end, unfortunately. Um, within the green area, this is the area that has been previously ascribed to Mexicanus. And the last estimate we had from Eduardo and, and Eric was about 800 adults, 400 breeding pairs. Uh, currently, our data indicates that um, you know the the numbers are probably somewhere in that range, 850 to 1150 is the range we get. Um, now, you know, again, um, you know whether these are the same birds right now is a bit of a question. When we look at some of the measurements that we're we're looking at in terms of morphometrics and also some of the the data on movements from the isotopes it does look like the birds in the upper gulf are doing something very different and maybe a little different than the birds further south and the birds in california so we want to keep an eye on this upper gulf region especially um now on the baja california peninsula the area in pink um this formerly was ascribed to California lease terns, but again, we haven't seen any of our California birds here, and we haven't seen any of the birds here in California. Um, and so the area around Guerrero Negro down to Bahia Magdalena, we're looking at about 500 adults or so. And then the, uh, the southern part of the Baja California Peninsula, the area in blue, this has been alternatively ascribed to both brown eye and Mexicanus. And here we've been in about 400 to 500 adults. So we have some questions we definitely need to, to work on here. Um, just a quick summary of all of this. Um, you know, we, we do have a lot of areas, in, especially in Sonora, um, where there are likely more small, um, less than 30 pair colonies that are in remote areas and are unsurveyed. Uh, we know um, there's at least 22 additional sites where we've seen or have had lease turns reported, particularly through eBird during the breeding season, um, but there's no record of a colony there. Um, so we, we need to get in and investigate some of these areas, particularly along the coast of Sinaloa, which is a, a bit of a difficult area to work right now. Um, now, within central and southern California, we definitely need to uh, refine our, our estimate. Uh, we're working on doing so right now. Um, but one of the kind of interesting, you know, things to take away from this is that, you know, for the, the area, you know, per mile or, or kilometer of coast, uh, we do have fewer lease turns in Mexico in the non-endangered population versus the endangered population in a similar area in California. So, um, you know, I think that one of the things that may come out of this is we might want to re-investigate whether um, you know, the, the, term, the least terms should be declared endangered in Mexico again. So um, again, I am the one presenting this, but this represents the work of a tremendous number of people. Um, our, our main investigators are on this, this list above, and you know, we, we're probably looking at in Mexico Oh God, probably close to 200 volunteers that, that help these investigators collect these data. Um, and you know, again, we thank all of them. Um, you know, people have been just amazing when it comes to both hospitality and then also, you know, local knowledge and innovation. Um, I can't tell you how how uh, how much we appreciate you know some of the the efforts that have been made down there. Uh, Miguel um, with the cameras that was just fantastic. Uh, so with that, I will open this up to, to any questions. I'm going to open up the chat as well here. Um, you know, please let me know if you if you have any questions. Great presentation, Great Tom. Presentation. Thank you so much for the work you're doing and the and the excellent uh, excellent presentation. So, um, yeah. So uh, Pete Mara, question. Tom, thank you so much. I, I unfortunately joined uh, 15 minutes late. I had a call that went over, but 
So I may have missed this. I apologize. Um, have you tried using geolocators or any other tracking devices to get uh, additional information on where birds are going, um, et cetera? Uh, yes, we we have. There were two efforts at geolocators, uh, one in 2012 and one in 2014. Uh, both times, all the geolocators returned corroded. Um, now, the interesting thing is we use the exact same batch on a population of Peruvian terns. They all came back perfect condition, still operating. So that was one of the really strong indications, Pete, that these guys are probably spending the winter logically. And we put the geolocators on their legs. And we know that they sit on kelp patties, you know, objects that are floating in the water. So we think that was the reason why the geolocators failed. Uh, we just did an attempt with GPS. And unfortunately, we, we had three birds come back. We weren't able to trap any of them. Um, and this year was a just a complete disaster at Estero Punta Banda. We had several colonies where the birds didn't come back. Um, so it wasn't just the one where we put the GPS on. There were multiple colonies in California where we had either poor attendance or no attendance. And we think that was because of the shutting down of the um, the, the winds in Central America, where they're likely um, spending the winter and, and birds just, you know, some areas they just didn't come back. So we've tried it, hasn't worked so far. Uh, part of the problem is a turn is only 40 grams, so we have to use store on boards. Uh, we will attempt it again when we have something that can transmit down at, you know, between one and 1 1.3 grams. I got no sympathy for you. I work on seven gram warblers. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, someday, Pete. Well, we will. We will get it. Thanks, Pete, for that question. Um, Tom, you've got a couple of questions. Uh, of course, Mike Green would 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 take the opportunity to ask two questions, or maybe even three questions in one. But there's a couple in the chat you might take a look at. Yeah. Um, okay. So first one, the um, uh, HPAI. Um, so far, thankfully, we have not seen um, any indication of it in any of our colonies. Um, we, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful with the distance that these terns nest from each other, um, especially when it comes to fecal contamination, that it won't be quite as bad as what we've seen at some of the colonies where birds are denser, such as the, uh, the elegant terns and the Caspian terns. Um, but yeah, so far, so good, not just knocking on wood. Um, negative effects on nest success. So within California, um, it is an endangered species, and we are working under permits from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So both when we've been doing the trapping and when we've been using the cameras, um, each year we do an annual look at um, nest success at nests where we either trap or use the camera, and nests that are laid down in the same time within the same grid where no trapping or camera work was done. And we've never seen any indication of an, of an impact on, um, on hatching success, which is what we've been using as a metric. Now, um, anecdotally, occasionally, um, you know, probably about one out of 30 deployments, we will see the turn actually go to the camera and pick at the camera. Um, so we definitely know that they know they're there and there's certain individuals that seem, you know, like they're a little bit more bothered than others. Um, but what we do see is that we have very good return rates to these nests. And one of the things we've actually detected is that a lot of times when we don't have a bird come back to a nest after a camera has been deployed, we find out from the monitors later on that that nest, um, had, had likely already failed. Um, so we haven't really seen too much problems with the cameras. Um, and the cameras also, they're only deployed on the nest for about, um, you know, five to maybe 15 minutes maximum. Let's see. Uh, one of the other questions from Hira, uh, banded turns reported from elsewhere in the United States. Um, to date, um, there has never been a confirmed... There is an error in the database, but there's never been a confirmed California lease turn uh, detected in either the interior or the eastern population or vice versa. So um, interestingly, though, that bird at Punta Raton in Honduras 
was seen at the exact same location as another first year bird from the Dakotas. Um, so it does look like there may be some mixing of first year birds down in, in central America. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Thank you uh, for the questions. And Carla Knobloch, thank you for joining us. She's got a question for you, Tom. Um, actually, just a sort of open-ended. If if you have, you know, some successes or some ideas that would help other working groups, and obviously you haven't been a working group uh, technically, but you've been in, in recovery mode for decades, if you will. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, ooh, there's a that's a. Boy, that, that, I, I could go on for probably a few hours on that one. Um, so challenges. I, I, I think a lot of the, oh gosh, probably like with a lot of us, um, as scientists, we know what we need to do to increase the productivity of these colonies. Um, I think a lot of the, the the problem lies in, you know, obtaining the, the funding in order to implement um, these protective measures at all of the different colonies uh, more equitably. Um, even in California, where we have certain colonies that, you know, have fairly large budgets and other colonies where, you know, the, some years it's just done by volunteers. Um, you know, that has been a, a challenge that's really faced the, the, the working group as a whole. Um, and then you know, getting funding also for, for basic protections um, in, in Mexico. Um, you know, as far as the, the, the you know, within the working group, everybody um, you know, really has a, a pretty good idea of the goal that we're after. Um, like any working group, there's, there's definitely a different ideas on how to accomplish that. Um, and yeah, I, I think that our, probably our biggest challenge is right now um, getting getting funding to continue both the research and the on the ground management. Okay, indications of food stress. Oh boy, we see a lot of that. Um, so you know, we you know, one of the things that we do each year is we do uh, weigh the birds. Um, when we we capture the adults, um, and we definitely in years of lower productivity we see lower lower body weights, lower average body weights. So, um, and then we see birds in in the really bad years. We see adults uh, that are down at. We've had some of these guys that are down around thirty eight pounds by the end of the nesting season, which is a really low end of the, the weight range for these terns. And then the other thing that we see with with foraging um, is we see more abandoned nests. And so this comes out in a couple of different ways. Um, obviously, abandoned eggs, but then also um, we'll get colonies where you'll have hatching, but we'll have hatching of what we call zombie chicks. So here in California and then also in Mexico, temperatures are adequate for the, the, the chick to continue developing in the egg even without an adult present. And so they'll hatch out and then die within a couple of days uh, because they haven't received any food from the adults. Um, so those are, those are two of our key um, key things that we're looking for. And then also um, average clutch size is a, a pretty good indication of, of years where we're having um, food issues. Thank you very much uh, for the question, Anastasia. And uh, Tom, Tom has one on, on audio video. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That was really great. And, and with such a, an impressive list of co collaborators and folks working throughout the, the whole Pacific there, I'm, I'm curious to know how, how, you, how, you, or how the group is organized. Do you, um, do you meet regularly? Do you have a methodology for, for somehow keeping all these collaborators in touch with the big picture? And, and how does that work for you? Oh gosh, um, we're currently okay. So up until now, um, it has really just been um, a very a, a loose conglomeration of of people that have a strong interest in preserving these terms um, who have worked together. We 
We had a, a, a fantastic uh, Sternula seminar in La Paz a couple of years ago, and it really cemented a lot of the kind of interpersonal relationships and, and got this thing going. Um, we actually only contacted Road to Recovery earlier this year. And so we're actually following, you know, right now, I'm, we're, we're, we're in the beginning stages for creating a more formal group. Um, and we're going to have a meeting in February where hopefully we'll be able to to put this into a, a greater structure uh, using the road recovery model. That's awesome. Great question, Tom, and great answer, another Tom. Um, and we're so happy you came to a road to recovery. And maybe you or some of your colleagues would attend that workshop uh, coming up because in the workshop in January, um, one of the topics that we are uh, going to have a panel discussion about is that very one is is how do we how are some, what are some good examples of some organizations that uh, or organizational structures that have worked for the various species working groups that are out there and and what uh, some lessons learned associated with it but thanks for finding us and I know Esmeralda is is kind of working with you to um, kind of go step by step and see how you might get organized to advance the recovery. And and that's one of the really important things is, is especially with our effort, we're, you know, across countries and you know, across regions. And there are so many different um, issues within each of the colonies and each of the, 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 the situations we've got, we've got monitors that, are you know are not trained scientists but have been doing this for years just out of love of the birds um it, it's it's a, a i think it's a, a i don't think it's terribly unique but um it's it certainly is a, 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 a environment where the social aspect um of this is is very important and um you know everybody listening I think to uh, you know, listening with open minds to the issues and the problems in each of the localities and not trying to come up with, you know, a one size fits all solution to these colonies. Um, I really think that's going to end up if, you know, being the key to our success um, is, is, is really you know, taking into account um, the, the, the human environment around each of these these areas and, and what are our local people say are, are their biggest needs um there there certainly are things that i've got a a, a whole list of, of stories of these you know great ideas one example is our, our electric fence for guerrero negro this year and um you know, we had this great idea to put electrified fence on the two access points where we've been having problems with coyotes. Perfect solution. We get down there, the local guys are like, no, not put this up. <laughs> put this up here. It's going to be gone the next day. And it's like, okay. And so, you know, we, we then ended up, um, um, our, our latest solution is actually using a, uh, a old used, nearly worthless monofilament net in place of a fence to keep the coyotes out. And um, so we're going to be trying that this year. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of great ideas that, um, you know, it's it, <laughs> people, people can have at a distance that just don't work well on the ground. So it really is important to, to be listening to the local folks. It's very clear, Tom, in your presentation that you have, um, Combine the biological with the social science. I mean, you understand how uh, that last remark was just uh, uh, peppered with those thoughts and, and sensitivities. That's uh, that's awesome, and certainly that's one of the things that we pride ourselves in in R two R is is combining those efforts. Do you have uh, access to a, a social scientist, for instance, or have you recruited one to be on the team, perhaps that can can help with um, advancing the great ideas you already have. Well, that's actually one of the things that uh, uh, when Esmeralda and I met the other, the other day we talked about is, is we definitely, you know, having somebody, again, I think that a lot of us, you know, we are good friends. Um, 
you know, everybody genuinely respects each other. Um, and, and that's carried us. But I, I really do think it'd be good to have that kind of outside look in at our program, um, you know, to try to keep things smooth. Because one thing I've learned is that you, know, you get a, a large enough group of people together and, and um, you know, it, it, it will start to come apart at the scene. So, you know, I, I, I think that that's something that all of us acknowledge and know and, and really don't want to happen. So, yeah, that's that's we're working on it. Great, thank you so much. Uh, any last minute comments or questions from any of the attendees participants before I I bring her to a close? Give you one last second. Well, Tom, any last minute uh, uh, thoughts from you? And then um, I'll I, yeah, I think if I would be very, you know, definitely interested in attending the meeting in January and would really like, I'm going to be attending the rest of these, listening to what others are doing. Um, I, I think that, you know, advice from outside, if anybody has things that have worked for them, um, I'd really love to, to hear that. Um, let's see, I'm going to throw... I think it might be somewhere else. Let me know the chat there. Um, you know, definitely feel free to, to email me if you've got other you know, other ideas, other comments. Um, and just again, thank you all very much for, for listening. Um, you know, be, becoming a little bit more aware of lease trends in California, Northwest Mexico. That's a great presentation, Tom, and and uh, very uh, great answers to the, the questions in the dialogue. Well, uh, for our, all the participants, I hope you've enjoyed it, uh, got, a, got something out of it. Um, and Tom, uh, again, thank you so much. I want to remind everybody, of, this is going to be a monthly um, effort. So every month, um, we'll have a different species up. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Lesser Yellow Legs working group might be up in uh, November for the presentation. I might have that wrong, but it, regardless, yeah, please uh, please join us. Also, another reminder about our workshop in January, go to our website and you'll see the draft agenda, uh, the flyer, and it'll lead you to registration and, um, and uh, all the information you need. So uh, again, thank you everybody. Uh, we're finishing right on time. I love that and I uh, hope you have uh, a great weekend coming up. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carla. Yeah, thanks so much for a great presentation. Yeah.